Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to see so many people being interested in history on the swing dancing. And uh, to my left, we have Peter Winkwist Lorenz here, and not only teaching with Katja uh, this weekend, uh, but also uh, giving a 45 minutes history talk. Um, 45 minutes, maybe a little more. Let's see. Uh, on uh, swing dancing, or especially, I took that, uh, choose that topic. Uh, how swing parties in the 1930s really were in the USA. I mean, for sure, what we have today, uh, everywhere in Europe, as swing parties was is not what happened back then. And I would like to uh, to clear up a little misunderstandings around that. And uh, I think we have the perfect guest here. So uh, please applause for for Peter. Thank you. Five minutes will be a new world record. <laughs> Usually, hour doesn't do enough. Yeah, and it's hard to stop me after two hours. But uh, we try. We try. Yeah, I take that challenge. So let's, see. <laughs> uh, let's see if we need beer, more beer in, in between. Um, yeah, I, I said that. Um, the topic is how swing parties in the 1930s, let's say, uh, have been. Um, and I would like to start. Um, when we prepared that, that history talk last week um, and had a little Skype session on that, um, I, I learned that, or you, when I said, how was a swing party? Uh, you said, tell me which day, you know? If we take Harlem, uh, the Savoy Ballroom, there's a difference between, let's say, a Saturday party and a Wednesday party. So maybe we start, so how is it different on what day you went to dancing in the USA? Let's say Harlem in, uh, in the Savoy Ballroom. Yeah, even that's a big topic. Um, <laughs> Well, like any business, they uh, most I would say most ballrooms uh, made their every night of the week something something uh, different, or they tried to make something new and different. But this changes constantly from the 20s through the 30s to the 40s. So there is no one stagnant way to do things. Uh, I think it was always changing, trying to figure out ways to uh, bring in more people. Um, uh, like at the Savoy, for instance, like you mentioned, we talked about a lot. Uh, I mean, people have to remember that the Savoy Ballroom was open a lot longer than just the Lindy Hop era. You know, the Lindy Hop was just a time and place in, in the history of America. Obviously, we know when it, when it was in, quote unquote invented um, after Lindbergh's flight, but it didn't really become part of mainstream pop culture um, until the mid 30s, maybe 35, 36. Uh, for the simple reason, that's when, as for those of you who have, I really recommend, I highly recommend you reading Frankie Manning's book, because it's one of the best, um, even though it is autobiography, uh, it is a very historically accurate, uh, it's, it's just a very important book, we don't have enough of these books, but um, one of the important things about, uh, about the, the, the Lindy Hop in the mid-30s, the second generation of Lindy Hoppers, that's when Hollywood came calling. So you know you're part of pop culture to some degree when they want to stick you in a Hollywood motion picture, a feature film, uh, to some, you know. So that's what happened. Um, and so when does the Lindy Hop era end? Well, there's no timeline. There's no specific date for this, unfortunately. But we can give it a, there's a, definitely a few years period in which the terminology Lindy Hop kind of falls out of favor. And that's around 1940, 41. And there's new terms come up. You know, jive became a big popular word. Jitterbug, right? Yeah, jitterbug was a, jitterbug goes back to the 30s, but it definitely becomes more of a mainstream term used um, in the, during the war. And then, um, but with uh, but with the Savoy Ballroom, um, the Savoy Ballroom, even though it opened up in the 1926, it went all the way to 1959. So you can, Savoy lasted through all kinds of different dance trends, music trends, and so forth. And most people don't even realize there was a time period for, for quite a long time that every, Tuesday nights at the Savoy Ballroom was Latin night. And that's where everybody did their, uh, Wednesday night they would go to the Palladium, which, in, which is in lower Manhattan, down what they call downtown area of Manhattan. Um, the Palladium, Wednesday nights. Uh, and then, um, so all the Lindy Hoppers started going to the Palladium on Wednesdays to check out this new rhythm, this new thing. Same with the musicians though, not just the dancers, Dizzy Gillespie, all the musicians, the same thing. They wanted to go see Tito Puente, they wanted to go see these guys. There's this new rhythm, it's jazz, but it's a different rhythm. And 
And then look at these dancers, the very, very famous mambo dancers like Cuban Pete. And uh, so the living audience would go down there and uh, dance to their music. And then here comes the Palladium dancers on Tuesday, they go back up to the Savoy. So it's always this, you know, what this ballroom's doing one thing, this ballroom's doing something else. But they've always had themes, many different themes throughout the years at the Savoy Ballroom. And it's just, like I said, it just, look how many generations lived at the Savoy Ballroom, starting in 26, going all the way to 1959. That's quite a few generations of dancers. And that's why we have the first generation of dancers, which is like the, um, the Shorty George. Everybody knows who Shorty George, uh, Shorty Snowden is. He would be considered part of the first generation of dancers. And then you have the, uh, what we all love and we're here for, Frankie Manning and the, the Wise Lindy Hoppers. That would be the, the second generation of dancers that came from the, all through the 30s. And then you have the third generation of dancers. And that would be people like, uh, one of the guys named Blue Outlaw, Jesse, Jesse James, uh, they were uh, Harvestman Ball winners as well. And, but they were the following generation, and you can see them in the 40s movies. Um, and then of course you could even say we have even a, uh, one last generation, and that would be um, like some of, the, some of the, thankfully some of the people that are still with us. Um, Sugar Sullivan kind of branches through the, 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 the uh, third and fourth, I would say. Sugar starts, for those of you who don't know, Sugar Sullivan is still around. She teaches in Harang. She was actually my dance partner for a couple of years in the early 2000s. And um, she won the Harvest Moon Ball with her husband, George, in 1955. Um, but you have the, so the Mamalu Park dancers. That's the late 40s into the 50s people. And then you have the, the late 50s into the 60s. So it's like it's blending. There's no, there's no cutting, dividing lines. But, but nonetheless, uh, it is different generations of dancers. And just like anywhere in the, I could even say outside of the States, but every, every generation is, tends to be in competition with its previous generation in everything we do, you know. That's how my dad did it. That's how my grandparents did it. I'm going to do it faster, you know, bigger. Wilder. Wilder, whatever, right. You're going to do it better, you know. Um, and so that's what happened in the dance, I would say. And even that, that, that could be the same thing because as uh, most people don't realize how, although we, I subscribe and I definitely agree that the Whitey's, Whitey's Lindy Hoppers is the, is the generation that really took the dance and brought it to the forefront of uh, what they were doing. And that had a lot to do with the time as well, um, being in the 30s. And it's, it's very, probably impossible for us to put ourselves in their shoes, uh, being someone that's obviously very young, uh, being a, a black kid from Harlem, and uh, not having any money, or definitely not having much money. And just the 30s in general, there wasn't a whole lot to do for kids um, in the city. You know, you got your bikes, you can there's there's, play some stickball, uh, but, but dancing is one of those things that's, uh, you know, affordable and uh, it's a great way to hook up with the opposite sex. And um, so a lot of these things come into mind and then you take it to the next level. Um, you're doing something at, at clubs in which people really want to see it. Because it didn't start in the Savoy, and uh, you weren't actually, you weren't even allowed to Lindy Hop in the Savoy for the first couple of years. We talked about this. Eccentric, eccentric. Yeah, you just weren't allowed to do any type of eccentric dancing. Um, and this is not just in Harlem, but across America, the, we, the whole country had to deal with this problem of you have all of your customers traveling around the floor, enjoying themselves, doing some type of basic foxtrot type of dancing. And then all of a sudden you have a few individuals that want to just dance still, uh, stationary, and, and uh, you know, make all those, make your customers very mad, right? So obviously the ballroom, the business, has to cater to their income. And so no stationary dancing, there was different kind of rules they would put out there. Every ballroom had their own answer for this. Um, and this went off to the late 20s into the early 30s as the traveling dancing and the stationary dancing was taking part in these big, big ballrooms. I even know of one particular ballroom, this particular ballroom I know of was in San Diego, and they actually, what they did is they put a big fence cage in the middle of the ballroom floor, in the middle of the ballroom floor, like an island. And if you wanted to do any type of jitterbug or stationary style dancing, you had to go to the middle of the dance floor, like in the cage, into Mike. the cage. And they called it the Jitterbug Jungle. Uh, this was in the 30s. And uh, that way the customers were happy because they were traveling around. They didn't have to worry about getting kicked. 
and uh, if you're a stationary dancer, go in the cage and kick yourself to death. It's just fine by us. At some point, different ballrooms came up with their own, uh, you know, their own things. At some, many ballrooms, obviously, etiquette, etiquette won over, basically. Because the simple reason is, back then, uh, usually people behaved in the ballrooms as they behaved outside of the ballrooms. It's one and the same. It's called going on in public. Uh, today, <laughs> that's kind of different in the Mindy Hop scene. It's like etiquette. Boom, leave it at the door. <laughs> Go kick everybody. Uh, today is a very different time period, yeah. Um, back then, no, it was, etiquette was still a big part of society and chivalry and watching out for one another and, you know, and not that fights and, and stuff didn't happen, they did. Uh, well, maybe that's why they didn't kick each other and they behaved because someone would draw, drag you right outside. And uh, that did happen quite a lot. That doesn't happen in the Lily Hop scene in the last 20, 30 years that I know of at all. Um, they need to be around to something here. I was expecting uh, that you would agree that Saturday night, for example, would be the perfect night for all the Lindy Hoppers that we know. You, you mentioned some Frankie Manning or right, Miller, right. other friends, but you said no, it, it, not necessarily. It was called Tourist Night. Yeah, that's the opposite. And that's still today. Yeah, even all the way up from the 90s. Yeah, Saturday night was the night you don't want to go to the Derby. Uh, that's where I'm from, Los Angeles. And we had a very nice place called the Hollywood Derby, which is a it's a historical place, a historical landmark place. It's a bar club and place for bands to play. But it's very, very nice. It has a dress code. You wouldn't go there with a t-shirt and jeans. They wouldn't let you in. Uh, but um, but it was just a nice place to go. And and it was seven. It started in the early '90s, and it was seven nights a week. And um, but Saturday night is the night you avoid because that's the tourist night. That's the night everybody goes out to dance, swing dancing who's never danced before, and you're never going to see them again. Mm -hmm. They're just, yeah, they're, hey, let's go swing dancing, okay. And they show up and there they are, drinking hand on the dance floor, <laughs> giving it a go. You know, and God bless those people, they paid the bills. We have circles around them. Uh, we need those people. Uh, the more tourists we can have that are out to visit dancing, the better. Even if they're not coming back, so what? It creates ambiance. To have a few extra hundred people in your clubs, and like I said, they're paying the bills, and they're not coming back. That could be a good thing, you know. Uh, and the cool thing about the tourists was they never take anything personal. They're just out to have fun, you know. They saw like what it, the, this is the truth. The truth is they saw started with they saw the movie Swing Kids, 1994. I'm gonna go swing dancing. That's what started, right? Um, but then, as you know, there's a lot of follow-up movies all through the 90s. The Mask, Swingers, you know, all these movies where you see little... And so that kept those Saturday nights just packed of tourists coming to swing dance for one night. Never to see them again. And so that, that's what you get. Obviously, in the 30s, people were a little more in touch with partner dancing. So it wasn't that bad. But, um, but yeah, that's the night where it's going to be really, really crowded. And you might not have the space that you want or need. Uh, to 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 dance. So you, you better go on a, on a weekday night. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And there, there were also really nice bands playing, right? I mean, on our parties, usually Saturday nights, a big party where the best right. band plays. Yeah. That was different back then. Yeah. Well, we had, that's where you also had you had your house at places like the Savoy Ballroom, and there's a few other big ballrooms that they they would have a house band, but then because they didn't have DJs, they also had to have another band go on when they take a break. So it was kind of like this back and forth between the bands. And so that's where you have the Savoy and the, the famous house bands. It was, I can't remember how many house bands with the Savoy, but I would say about 20 ballpark area, 20 house bands. But the most famous is obviously Chick Webb. And, um, and then whoever wants to be on the stage next to them. And so that's where they also started the band battles as another way to get people to come and check out. We're gonna have a battle of the bands, you know. Uh, Benny Goodman versus Chick Webb or Duke Ellington, the big names usually. And um, were they really battles? Yeah, some people took it. I think some musicians and band leaders took it more serious than other band leaders took it. But there wasn't actually a technically a winner. Um, and for the simple reason that the newspapers would come out and they would uh, write who they believed was the winner, you know, and that wasn't always what the dancers would say. So the real winners was all the dancers. Let's just put it that way, which is the same as today, right? Um, but there was some up one up and shit for sure. Some bands really did try to, to, to really actually battle and try
try to make the other band look bad. Um, but most often it was pretty friendly. Um, but there are some weird stories of musicians putting interesting objects in the other band's musician instruments, for instance. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, there was some... There, that, uh, Banana and the trumpet. Yeah, one of those things, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, there was some of that, but, but not much. Most of it was friendly battles. We talked about this a little bit, yeah. And I, one of the things I mentioned was the fact that most people don't realize that most of the big, most of the, I say, most of the successful big bands, we have the Artie Shaws, the Benny Goodmans, the Duke Ellingtons, everybody looked up to Chick Webb a lot. And it wasn't just because of, uh, he's the house band of the Savoy, and he did a great job of playing dance music, but also they felt sorry for him. Here's a guy that was born crippled, you know, and um, he obviously didn't have a very fun life being in the physical condi health condition that he was in. So there was a lot of, uh, felt a lot of sorrowfulness for the guy. And so they really put him up on a pedestal. It's like, they worship Chick for many reasons, you know, like, and so, my point of this is, no, no, I can't really see as anybody going to the Savoy Ballroom, that's like the king of swing, let's say the Betty Goodmans or the Dukes, or, and actually wanting to really kick Chick Webb's ass. It's like, no, we want to respect that guy. This isn't a, you know, uh, so that's number one. They, they love the guy way too much and respected him too much to, to actually battle him seriously. Um, it's kind of like playing, I don't know, it's like playing a, it's like playing some game with your, your kid, you know? You're not just gonna whoop your kid's ass, he's five years old, you know what I mean? Over and over and over again, that's not cool, right? Your kid's gonna hate you. So of course you let your kid win, and that's what, you know, and it's a balance of knowing when to let your kid win to keep the game going, right? So that's what the battles are more about, yeah, I would say. So, so we, they, they had really nice light music all night long. What, what happened on the dance floor? I mean, we, we touched that topic a little uh, earlier. Um, was, I mean, if we look at the dance party tonight, probably there are most of the people dancing Lindy Hop, uh, some people dancing Balboa, some Shag, some doing solo stuff. So that's all night long and then in the later night it's getting a little slower, I guess, and then maybe it's getting a little bluesy from the music. So that's today. How was that? in the Savoy. I mean, there were not everybody was dancing in the yard, right? right? Not at all. Well, if you think about the two bookends, the beginning of the Savoy and the end of the Savoy, in the very beginning of the Savoy, the whole ballroom was always traveling, whether it's slow or fast, it's just traveling. And at the very end of the Savoy, when they closed it, everybody was pretty much stationary. That's the rock and roll era. The traveling means the dance right, right, right. in one direction around the... Right, foxtrot yeah. and so forth. Right, right. Uh, but again, it, it would depend on the night and the bands because obviously people are going to dance to the bands and whatever the bands are playing is what you're going to respond to and then they're going to put certain bands on certain nights, right? One of the bands I mentioned to you is the Casa, uh, no not Casa Loma, but the uh, Guy Lombardo. Guy Lombardo and his Canadians. Probably one of the most popular bands in the history of all big bands and dance bands and probably most of you probably never even heard of him. Uh, because he played sweet music, he didn't play hot music, he played social dancing music, that's it, social dancing music. And he was Louis Armstrong's favorite big band. So I'm just going to put that out there, he was Louis Armstrong's number one favorite band. Now here's the guy that started the band in 1970, around 1970, 1919 I think it was. But the band went all the way till 1977. This guy had more number one hits in 30 years than all the bands put together. Like, he's number one, number one, number one, number one, year after year after year after year. No one can touch this. Because that was, to me, that band like Guy Lombardo, or what we would call sweet music, or what most people call sweeter music, is even though it's not the stuff you, you particularly like, you want that hot stuff, I know. You want that Fletcher Henderson and that, that Chick Webb and Count Basie, and you want that hot stuff. But that's a minority of the population of Americans. That's the kids, that's the younger people want that hot stuff. The rest of the country, millions, want the sweet stuff, the normal stuff, the stuff that they can just relax, hold your husband or wife with, and just enjoy the ride around the floor, and maybe even have a talk, a, a talk while you're dancing. And that's why Guy Lombardo was so famous, because he did it his own way, nobody told him what to do, and all of a sudden people really loved what he was doing. And so that's one of the things Louis Armstrong said, man, nobody told him. This is a guy that did it his own way and he stuck to it the whole time. 
and look how successful he was. And it's just not, but, it, but let me be clear, this was not for old people. Um, when, if you're 16, 17 years old, you also want to talk and, and hold somebody in your arms, even if it gives you butterflies in the stomach. Still, that's a pretty special moment to grab a, a, a somebody that you're infatuated with, let's just say, and, and stare at each other with love bubbles. They just walk around the floor to the music, you know. This was the number one most important reason to dance ever, and will always be the most important reason to dance ever. Uh, the, the, the minority is, becomes, it becomes a sport, you know, where you just want to work on things, you know, like we do today. It's kind of more sport. Um, so the, the idea of Guy Lombardo was very important because uh, Frankie talks about him in his book. He broke the Savoy Ballroom attendance record by thousands and thousands. Nobody ever came close. And um, yeah, and then a couple, it wasn't that long after, he did a, another concert in, in Chicago, and it was a ballroom where he went well over 20,000 people. Like, Count Basie's lucky to get two or 3,000. You know, so just put that into perspective how important Guy Lombardo is. Another interesting thing is in the late 30s, when you had the very first generation of jazz collectors, historians and so forth. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them came from France, some from England, but they all came to America and they all went to Harlem. This is in the late 30s. And they went to Harlem and they went through all that they were looking for those rare jazz records. And they went through the, all the attics and all the basements and all the closets and all the storage units. And all these collectors would find is damn Guy Lombardo records. <laughs> like, where's all the cool hot stuff? No, everybody wanted Guy Lombardo. This white dude from Canada. And um, the, the, the best way I read about there's a book I recommend it too for everybody too. It's a really good book on the subject, kind of, uh, and it's called, it's called How the Beatles. Kill rock and roll, believe it or not. What? Yeah, how the Beatles destroyed rock and roll, something like this. And they talk about the fact that we've taken things from history, these novelty, very rare gems, whether it's that individual blues musician that lives in the middle of Alabama and his name happens to be Blind Lemon Jefferson, you know, and we pull him out of the woods and we put him in a studio or we record him and then today we think of this as like wow everybody must have been just listening to this guy because he's so great when in fact nobody's ever heard of him he was just this one guy in the middle of the swamps but it took one nerve to pull this rare gem so we've taken all these novelties and these rare gems and these very special things and special people and special music but we've made it we've turned it into like it was all mainstream and it wasn't that's the thing. These were all very, very rare things that we're all celebrating today. And, uh, but the truth is, Guy Lombardo is what it was really all about. And the best way I can describe it is, it was the background music of those times. It was the background music. It's the music you went to work to. It's the music you went to the train to. It wasn't necessarily the thing that you looked at and focused on and studied, but it was always there. And so, for that reason, maybe it, so it, maybe it wasn't that special because it was always there, you know. Um, but I can't stress enough how important that was. And then also you have the recording industry uh, really skewing everything for us as well. And this is the sad part. This is the real sad part, is you have bands like, um, uh, well, in Roseland, in, in, in New York, in Manhattan. You have the, the big ballrooms in New York, by the way, would have been the Savoy Ballroom, Glen Av the, the, the Avedon, the Glen Island Casino, and Roseland, so Savoy, four. And at the Roseland, you had, that's where Fletcher Henderson was the house band in the, uh, for, for a large part of the 1930s. And his trumpet player, Rex Stewart, talked about this a lot in, 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 his, in his autobiography. And he talks about them battling this other band named uh, Gene Colgate's band. And the Gene Colgate band, for those of you who don't know, it was, a, it was a white band, and it was the band that Vic Firebank was the cornet player, Frankie Trombauer on saxophone, just just really good, good quality musicians. Well, the problem is they had a battle between Fletcher Henderson and apparently uh, uh, the Colgate band actually blew the doors out of the Fletcher Henderson band. Just blew them, and, 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 and the trumpet player, uh, Rex Stewart, talks about it. He goes, man. He said something to the effect, I don't remember the words he used, but basically he said, we got our asses handed to us by these white boys, you know. And he goes, but, but, he did, but then he follows up by saying, but 
we played much better waltzes. <laughs> we were a much better sweet band. And so and when we think about that, just to put that into perspective with LNU, the Fletcher Henderson band, we don't really think of being a sweet band. We think of that as being a hot jungle Harlem band, you know. But that's not really the case. They were actually a very, very damn good sweet band. But unfortunately, the record companies said to the, to the, to the, to the, to the black orchestras, we don't want you playing sweet music. You're a black band. We want you playing that hot jungle music because that's why everybody buys your records. And you're a white band. I don't want you playing that hot stuff. I want you to play the sweet stuff. So unfortunately, we have a complete opposite that's been preserved for us all to listen to. As you collect those shellacs, now you know. Everything's been rearranged for you, uh, unfortunately, because of the record labels. Not that they don't do that today, they do in a different way, but everything's been really skewed for us, so we really don't know. And the, obviously the first question is, what, you guys play waltzes? Yeah, they love waltzes. <laughs> Man, and that's one of my, my, my favorite quote is, jazz music is not a time signature. Jazz music is many time signatures. It can be two, four, 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 three, four, six, eight. Waltz is the king of jazz. It starts with waltz. Where do you guys think the two-step comes from? It comes from the waltz. Um, everything we do comes from this waltz. Why do we dance in this position? The waltz. Uh, what's the king of all? I would even say the waltz is the king of all street dances. If you think about it, I mean, it, it was for, for for over almost 200 years. It was done in the dirt by peasants in their boots. It was. It took a, at least a couple hundred years before the upper echelons decided to make it into something it's not, right? Or now now that we all think it's, you know, this this, this fancy ball of Mimi's ball. No, it took hundreds of years before that. And um, so it really was the king of, of, in a weird, odd way, the king of street dancing, because for 200 years it was done literally in the dirt, um, both in a, in a hand graph like so, and then they adjusted it to make it more appropriate, apparently. And that's where you get the lead hand with the, with the one hand and not just two hands hanging onto each other. Um, but it's a really important part of America's story, the story of American social dance, because it really does start in the 1800s, post antebellum, which is after the Civil War. Up until that point, all the dances we were doing were all inherited from over here. Um, primarily, primarily French, but a lot of British dances. And a lot of those dances, we just renamed them. Uh, just gave it an Americanized name. Uh, like the Virginia Reel, for instance. It's actually a very old British dance, but we just renamed it. Uh, it's obviously not a partner dance, but it's a Contra style dancing. But we, it wasn't until around the 1860s that we shed away from us um, the old world concept of dancing. Up until that point, believe it or not, everybody, you actually kind of inherited how you dance. You didn't get to just pick how you dance, you silly individuals. No, you got that from your parents, you got it from their parents, you got it from their parents. You have to behave a certain way and act a certain way and move a certain way. But we shed that away in about the 1860s and, and so you actually could be an individual and you can in fact do it however you want and we're not going to punish your parents. It's kind of one of those things. And, um, but still, we're still doing a lot of the old world dances, the mazurkas, uh, the shotsies, the polkas, of course. Uh, most of the ballrooms in America, you guys have to understand, that were built all through the 1800s were built by the German immigrants for polka dancing. They didn't become swing dance ballrooms for 50, 60 years sometimes. A lot of those ballrooms were all for polka, especially all through the Midwest, from Minnesota all the way down to Arkansas, through, yeah, all through the Midwest. Many, many, many polka ballrooms. But then what happened was, uh, all of a sudden, the Dos Temps showed up. There's a dance called Dos Temps. It's a style of waltzing. Those temps, obviously, two steps, actually two tempos is what that really means, but it was translated into two step. And then you start singing, and we know this because we have all the dance cards. And in the old days, you were told what dances you're gonna do ahead of time when you when you walked in the ballroom. You have a, you'd either get it in the mail ahead of time or you got it presented to you, but you had a card. And, it, and oftentimes, you could open it up and it had all the dances there that you're gonna do through the night with the little, with the blank spot, and that's where you get your partner to sign in there, you know, so I remember who I danced with for that number. And in the beginning, it had all these weird dances, but then slowly, here comes the Dos Tents, and then the Mazurkas, and then slowly but surely, all the dances start to disappear, and Dos Tents turns into two steps, it says two step, and by 1890, about, depending on where you are, 
you would have almost all two steps and all waltzes. That's it. It would really, really, literally shed away a lot of those old dances. Uh, and again, it depends on where you were, because in the Midwest, we in the in the rural communities of America, you hung on to some of the older traditions longer. Um, it's the same as language. Language is in the big cities. Everything moves much faster in the big cities. Whereas in the countryside, everything's a little more outdated and old-fashioned. And, uh, and so that's kind of what happened. And so you had the two-step, and then of course, as we, as we learned the Peabody today, which is an early teens dance, but it's a one-step. And the one-step becomes a phenomenon starting in the very early part of the 20th century. And then by 1910, it's very dominant. Um, and there's plenty of different, like I mentioned in the classes, there's a lot of different one-steps, of course. But it all becomes two-steps and one-steps and waltzes. And any of you who have ever been to New Orleans, you already all know this, but in New Orleans, all the New Orleans jazz bands, they still play waltzes. They never stopped. They kept playing waltzes all the way through. They, you know, in the teens they played waltzes, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, they've always played waltzes. Because that's what they do. It's, it's like I said, it's uh, and you never know. The funny thing about the New Orleans bands is, is you never, uh, they mix it up so much. They might play a song that you're all very familiar with, um, I don't know which one, but let's just pick one off the top of our head. Uh, Canal Street Blues. Well, you might hear them play that band, that song, Canal Street Blues, uh, tonight, and they might play it in a, in a nice, like a nice, slow, bouncy tempo. But then the next night, they might play it faster than hell. Just frantically fast. But then all of a sudden, you hear the third night, they play it in the waltz. And it's the same damn song. And that's the improvisational nature of jazz coming out of New Orleans. You just, you never play this, you, you never play the same song the same way twice. Even if you wanted to, it's impossible. We're too bored up here, let's play this song. Hey Bill, what do you want to, what tempo do you want to play it at? You know, they're always playing it differently and so forth. And that all changed in the 30s with the swing era, where everything became standardized. Everything was like, I, 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 the best way to explain swing music is, is to be honest, for myself is to really think about it like this. Most people didn't understand jazz in the very beginning. And the, the simple reason was the collective improvisation. And the best band to use as an example is the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Or we can think about bands um, such as um, the band that Louis Armstrong played with in the early 20s. Um, I'll think of his name in a minute. Um, King. King uh, yeah, thank you. And then you also have the trombone, trombone player too, Kid Ori's band, in the early 20s. And all these guys, if you listen to the recordings, it's this collective improvisation. And what I mean by that is everybody's improvising at the same time. The clarinet, the trombone, the saxophone, everybody's playing like their own thing. And at that time period, it was, we didn't understand it. What I mean by we is I mean the main population of people. It was just too much going on. We were not born and raised in this cultural thing. But it wasn't until the late 30s that you had people like Bill Russell and these, these jazz academics or jazz historians really sit down and listen to it and go, wait a minute, listen to what these guys are actually playing. The trumpet's playing the melody, that's called the root note. The clarinet's kind of meddling around him, just doing whatever, but they're playing, he's playing the third, and the trombone is kind of filling up the spot with these loud things in the background, that's the fifth. When they play together, that's a chord. How is that possible? These guys don't read or write music. They're playing by ear, and they're doing this on the fly, improvising at this tempo. How is it possible to do this? This is so advanced, it just, it just, it's insane. How does this work? This is not true. So then everybody frantically went back to New Orleans to try to find out all the old people that are older than Louis Armstrong. You know, and that's where you have the very first revival uh, of 1938, 39, 40, where you have Bunk Johnson discovered working in a field somewhere. Hey, are you the famous guy, Bunk Johnson, that used to play with Buddy Golden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you know how to play trumpet still? Yeah, if you buy me some teeth and buy me a new horn, maybe I can still play. These people had quit. Um, and so he put together bands with these old, original, old players. And he had like, like uh, uh, George Lewis on clarinet and uh, just these, these incredible players from the teens and 20s who never got their day in the light in swing music, right? And so what my point of this is, is those early years of collective improvisation that we didn't understand as a main population of humans. What we did is, and the record companies and the industries did, and, and business did, we put water on it. 
We kept putting water on it until it became swing. Which is what? Which is classic Count Basie. Here's the riff. Everybody play this riff. Now one person solo. Lester, you take it. So we can understand what's going on here. So really, if you want to think about it, there's a great debate and argument to be made that swing music is just a dumbing down of jazz music for the masses. Uh, which I hate to say, but it's very true. If you're a music, if you're any kind of musicologist, it's very, it's, it's all laid out there for you to go look at. It's like, wow, they really did make it simpler and simpler and simpler. Because this is why I like the 20s so much, because the 20s was such an exploratory time period for the dance bands. You had this collective improvisation stuff going on with the small New Orleans bands, but then you had the bigger bands doing dance arrangements, you had Tin Pan Alley songs, and so the, the, the band leaders were trying to make the music exciting for the dancers. So there's changes, rhythm changes, there's breaks, there's these weird solos. Some stuff is great, some of it's horrible, but it's all experimental. Trying to find out what works, what works, what do people like? And that's the 20s, uh, you know, that's why you just find the most brilliant stuff in the 20s. And you find a lot of the most horrible stuff in the 20s too. It didn't work out, but still they're trying to invent, invent, invent. Well, that's all gone by the, by the, you know, by 1935, 36, 37, 38, 39, it's gone. It's just this clean riff, you know, and then there becomes a new way to try to make it exciting, as you know, and we start in the, the not only the fancier arrangements, but more importantly, the bopping, the more or less the bebop generation starts to slowly come in, and, and the bebop generation kind of has a, what's the word for it, um, they kind of have animosity towards all this. Like, we've been, like, if you're a musician, do you want to sit down in front of a music stand all night and just read music? You know, I mean, that, that, comes, that becomes a job after a while and it's just work. But if the band is like, hey man, cut loose, do whatever you want. I hired you because you're good. Play your heart out. You're going to be a little bit happy about your job. And you're going to probably stick around a little longer. And so this is part of the swing era. Part of the interesting thing about the swing era is these little stories that I'm telling you about how yeah, some of it makes perfect sense, but some of it's like, wait a minute, it wasn't always the best time period for everybody, you know. Coming back to the, to the dance floor, um, you, you mentioned a lot of different dances that just basically reduced to, you said, waltz, uh, one and two step, right. and then all the swing dances that we know. Right. So if you, let, let's say I, I would visit uh, the Savoy Ballroom on a, what was the hottest night for the swing dancers? It depends on which Wednesday. When Wednesday was a good night during okay, the Thursday. Okay, so then, yeah. I, I visit there on a, on a Wednesday. So what would I see uh, there? I mean, was uh, Frankie there in the corner with some some super dancers and yeah, there absolutely. was just twenty Lindy Hoppers and the rest was social dancing to sweet music or no? Well, it would have been Chick Webb for sure. So he wouldn't have had any sweet music on um, that night. Um, but as you just said, Frankie in the corner. Um, one of the stories, again, I can't stress enough for you all to read Frankie's book, but part of, one, of the, one of the corners of the ballroom at the Savoy, they called it Cat's Corner. And I think I should clarify that just a little bit because it's been a little bit exaggerated and taken out of context. There was no sign over that corner of the room saying Cat's Corner. It's basically like any, I would think, it's like any dance you go to today, uh, depending on what city you're in or an event. Events are a little bit different, but you'll get what I'm saying. Usually, the locals all hang out by the DJ booth at your local dances. That's just what they do. I don't know why. That's just where my, I know my jacket's safe. I just throw it under the, you know, that's where maybe your purse might be safe. I don't know, but for whatever reason, the DJ booth corner, you can consider that, that's the cat's corner of today, is the DJ booth corner. Well, that's the same thing that happened in the Savoy Ballroom. It's just the locals' corner. Um, and what they meant by cats was just the cool people's corner. But in the 30s, for whatever reason, they, they thought it was cool to call each other cats. That's a cool cat. Hey man, you're a cool cat. I don't know why, but that just was the slang for people back then. So that's why it got the name Cat's Corner. It had nothing to do with animals, and it had nothing to do with signs and designated spots. Uh, anybody can go into that corner and dance. It's just a, that part of the dance room, mall and floor. And um, yeah, you would see a lot of different dances for sure. And what happened at the Savoy specifically is, for instance, we talked about this in the Peabody class, uh, <laughs> the Brooklyn dancers were really well known for their uh, being great, great Peabody dancers. And um, just as the Shag dancers from another ballroom called the Ford, the Ford, the Fordham ballroom was 
happened to be a ballroom where all the, the shag dancers used to go. But everybody wants to go to Savoy, because Savoy is the, the best of all the ballrooms, number one, and has the best of all everything. The best floor, the best band, the best everything, and the best dancers are there. So at some point in your dancing careers, you get to a point where you think you're pretty good. And it's time for you to go to the Savoy to realize that you're not good, really. That's kind of the typical story, right? Um, then it happens, you hear these stories over and over again. Frankie mentions some of them in their books. But whatever dance came in that ballroom, it came from different, uh, different boroughs of New York. And, um, and whatever dance came in that ballroom, immediately the Savoy dancers would, of course, steal it, like we do today. If you're doing some cool dance in front of me, yeah, of course I'm going to steal the damn thing from you. It's cool, thank you, you know, that's not a bad thing at all. It's actually more of a compliment that you're doing such a cool thing that I would steal it. But it's the same thing happened at Savoy, and Frankie was very, Frankie was really into this. He really enjoyed stealing dances and steps. And so the Peabody dancers would show up, well, Peabody is now a Savoy ballroom dance, you know. The uh, shag dancers would show up from the Fordham Ballroom. There comes and, and Norma Norma Miller. She called all the, the the white shag dancers. She called them the what the wide legged shaggers. The wide legged shaggers, because that's what they called the the Arthur Murray shag, or what you guys call the collegiate shag today. They call them the wide legged shaggers because they lift their knees up so high and they're so wide legged, and they make fun. And so the Savoyans would make fun of them because there were. Savoy dancers that already that, that did do shag, but they did the eight count shag, and they didn't. They kept it more sophisticated and uh, more of a shuffling type of a step. And uh, so yeah, and then often they would even change the names of some of the dances. So all of a sudden, uh, something like um, like the like the Peabody, they started calling it. They call it like the Savoy Walk, for instance. Um, blues dancing, they like they actually called it ballrooming. Uh, you know, and again, every generation of Savoy ballroom dancers, they didn't call it the same thing as the previous generation, so it's really confusing. And what, what, what percentage of, of the whole ballroom? I mean, there were a few thousand people dancing, uh, I think, if it was really crowded. Well, no, how you many, can, how you many can people fit, were dancing? You can fit a couple, a couple thousand people in the Savoy, yes, but not on the dance floor. Not, 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 wasn't. People, that's another imagination, a thing that's been stretched. Because um, when I first started dancing, I would go to Frankie lectures and Frankie talks and all. And, yeah, the, the Savoy Ballroom was a was a was a whole block long, a whole block wide, and da 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 da. Well, come to find out, almost most ballrooms were a block long and a block wide because that's the size of a ballroom. It takes up one city block, and depending on what city, of course, there's going to be a, a discrepancy in, in, in measurements because they're not all the same. But no, it was a normal sized ballroom. Uh, the biggest ballrooms, no, there was, the Savoy Ballroom in Chicago was a big ballroom. Way big, but maybe five times bigger. It was so big, they couldn't fill it and it went out of business. So there's much bigger ballrooms in the Savoy, than the Harlem Savoy. Um, uh, but uh, of course I don't know specific percentages, because this is the fluctuating, every song is going to fluctuate differently. Like I said, uh, it's impossible to know. But we do know for sure that, you know, when Chick played a hot number, the, the majority of the ballroom was swinging out or trying to, you know. Uh, when Chick played a down, down slow number, nobody was Lindy Hopping. They, because back then, Lindy Hop was a specific tempo. And what I mean by specific tempo, I don't mean specifics as in the BPMs, but it was very specific dance you do to certain rhythm, rhythmic feelings. But as soon as it gets down to a certain slow tempo, now that's where you hold each other. And you're either going to travel, or you're going to rock and rhythm, or you're, you're going to do this ballrooming thing I mentioned, um, which is just, all ballrooming was, was just think about a Lindy Hopper's couple trying to mimic a slow ballroom dancing couple. That's all it is. But they just happen to be really, really good dancers. So it looked pretty okay, you know, and that's the only reason that they, you know, because they made fun of ballroom and you know, like standardized professional ballroom dance. They made fun of that, you know, aha, we can do that, and they take it, and we're going to do it our way. And so, uh, and that's something we always, me and Katya, always carry with us through our classes, and we always share that 
I don't want you to do this Peabody like a ballroom dance. I don't want you to do this blues like a ballroom dance. I, don't, I want you to do it like I always use the same words Frankie does. Do it like a Lindy Hopper would do it. You know, which means do it however you want to do it. Be yourself. Don't try to standardize what you're doing and turn it into something that it's not, which is ballroom. And I mean, there's just nothing credible about ballroom, to be honest with you, in the first place. Um, to, to make everybody look the same in order for you to judge them. It's just a stupid concept. You gotta must have a bored ass life to do something like this, in my opinion. Because uh, you're not doing it for the music anymore. You're doing it for the frame. I understand the movement and, and, and you know, and trying to fit in the mold that you're not meant to be in. That's a very disciplined thing to do in a lot of practice, but I can think of more fun things to do than that. So the, so my, the, the percentage thing is very difficult to say, but, but for sure, there's times in where the whole bottom is swinging out, for sure, absolutely. And then there's times where all the Lindy Hoppers were like, no, you don't Lindy. They, if, we were, if they were here today, they would say, uh, there's a lot of music that we dance to today, Lindy, I would say Lindy Hop to, um, that they would have never Lindy Hop to. It's too slow. It's, this is a song for us to hold one another to. It doesn't have the excitement, you know. And it gets to the point, it gets to the whole damn argument or debate on what is Lindy Hop and what isn't Lindy Hop, you know. And every old timer had their own uh, answer to that, you know. Uh, but one of the best ones was uh, Frankie's son, Chaz, who many of you know Chaz, Chaz Young, he's still around. He gave the, one of the greatest answers. Of, he goes, when they asked him, what is Lindy Hop to you? And what isn't Lindy Hop to, you know. Chaz, and this is on a panel discussion, and Chaz goes, you know you're seeing Lindy Hop? When it makes you stand up and start clapping, that's Lindy Hop. Uh -huh. And everyone's like, wow, that's a deep answer, man. <laughs> Whoa, because it doesn't always make me do that, you know. Um, so that's one of the great things, you know. And then, like you were saying earlier about what would happen when you walked into the Savoy. Norma talked about this. When you walked into the Savoy ballroom, actually you'd, be, you'd, you'd walk upstairs. But when you looked across the floor, you immediately saw Frankie. Immediately in a whole ballroom, there's Frankie. Because he's the only one dancing horizontal to the floor. <laughs> that was his style, that was his thing, that was his shtick, that was his that was him as an individual. Um, he was the only one that did that. You know, and there was a time in 1939 where there was a, 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 a large contingency of younger up-and-coming dancers trying to mimic and copy Frankie. And so you did have, for a short time, everybody trying to, uh, younger people trying to copy Frankie for a short time, but that only lasted, like I said, part of the season in 39, that Norma remembered vividly. But other than that, no, everybody's an absolute individuals. And this is part of the unfortunate aspects, and it's also, it's not only unfortunate, there's a benefit to it, but we don't have that same individuality as they did back then, and then originality, because back then, uh, originality was really one of the most important things to have to win contests. It was very, very important to be different and original and do something completely weird and different, you know. Um, and so that's something we don't, uh, we don't award originality at all anymore. As a matter of fact, we kind of punish it because we can't rotate with you throughout the night because, you you know, we need for you to be a little standardized today so you can rot rotate and change partners all night. But you have to remember, a lot of these dancers, um, especially a lot of the LA dancers, I can think of like Hal Tech here and his wife Betty, um, their LA style of swing dancing they did in the 30s, um, they, he was probably the most winning dancer in history, as far as I'm concerned. Um, as far as street dancing, partner dancing, swing dancing is concerned. He, nobody has won more contests than Hal and Betty. But the thing is, is Hal and Betty, they learned Dean's Lindy just so they could change partners and, so, and social dance. Because their style of dance was so original, it was impossible to do in any type of social capacity with somebody strange that doesn't know it. So that's how extreme originality can be. That it's so original that you can't do it with anybody else. Well today that's not something we award. I mean we might say that's cool guy, but uh, we don't award it. You're not gonna win any contests like that, that's for sure, no way because we put the teachers in charge of judging all the contests. And so if the teacher doesn't teach it, they're not gonna award it. They're only gonna award it if they can do it. 
And they're certainly not going to award it if they can't do it. That's for sure. Uh, if we get back to doing contests like the old days, where we have a lot more public, uh, you know, more public applauding, and, or, or uh, if not the public, let's just say um, celebrities. Celebrities were some of the best judges back in the old days. Um, and I don't just mean anybody, but I mean like real celebrities, such as uh, dance directors for, for MGM, Nick Castle, you know, who actually was the dance director for Hell's a Poppin. Um, oh, and also he was, well, and then you had Hermes Pan, of course, the dance director and all the Fred Astaire stuff, and you had Louis Dupron, and these were all dance directors of the different motion picture movies. Uh, but then you had also people like Gene Kelly, and you had, uh, these were the people that would actually come and judge contests. And that's what gets more people to come to your ballroom to watch the contest. Even though they know, I don't know what he's judging, but I'm going to go watch it anyways. And I keep, I've been telling this for, well, for 20 years of teaching in Europe, I've been telling European events to do the same thing. Like, invite your most popular football, soccer star, to come and judge a contest. I mean, they're going to say, I don't know how to dance, so what? I want you to come for 30 minutes to my event, drinks are on us, um, and uh, we want you to judge, you are the voice of the public. And then you're going to have people that are soccer players, young kids hopefully, go, hey, why is this soccer star going to judge this contest? Let's go, because I want to get an autograph there. And maybe that's how they get introduced to dance. But as soon as you get the public outside of here involved into the contest and so forth, it's a, it's an up, a good opportunity to get more people involved in the, in the dance scene. Instead of us just judging for each other, dancing for each other, performing for each other, we're all in our own little comfortable shoebox, retro, totally detached from the outside world. <laughs> and, uh, and that's one of the things that I'm always trying to push boundaries and trying to uh, plant seeds in different cities, cultures, because it's always different. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's going to work, first off. Kachi, I have Katya to remind me all the time, Peter, she's always telling me, Peter, they don't have a bar to go out social dancing and shut up. All they have is a DJ and that's all. It's like, okay, okay, sorry. Um, so I have a good, I have a good person, a good perfect teammate for that, but um, to teach me reality of the real world. Uh, but, but the point is, is uh, it doesn't mean there's not ways you can figure out yourself to get the public involved in one way or another. And I think celebrity judges are the by far the best. Of course, there's going to be that argument, but then you're going to do a bunch of stupid stuff and you're dancing to win. Well, you're right. Guess what? The Lindy Hall has a lot of stupid stuff that I love. Slow motion, itching, the Dutchman. These are all stupid steps. But they're supposed to be done, and they're, be, they're done for a reason. Slow motion you do because the song is eight minutes long, and you're dancing 250 beats a minute. Slow motion will save your ass. And it might win you that contest, too, because everybody else is huffing and puffing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're the only couple out there doing this slow swing out. So the judges see that, they're like, oh, that's so cool. Same thing with itching. These are moves that were done for a reason. You know, the Dutchman. Whenever you see somebody do, or what, some people call it the candlestick, some people call it, you know, the one where you put your follower up and the feet go in the air. Right, that one's meant to be done in one situation, and only one situation, and that's when you're in a contest and the whole ballroom floor is filled. And you're in the middle of that ballroom floor and you want to be seen. <laughs> up goes your follower's legs. That's how you get seen. When you see people do the contest today where you have eight eights each, eight eights each, eight eights each, yeah, somebody goes out for their eights and does a judgment. It's like, wait a minute, why are you doing that move when you have a spotlight? That move is supposed to, you know, like we don't even know why these moves were supposed to be done and we're using them incorrectly today. And that's not a bad reason, it's not a bad thing to incorrectly use them, I think it's fine, but I would like to get back to using these fun, shitty things Imagine in your 8-8s and you go out and you do the itch with your partner. I mean, today the teachers are going to be, the judges are going to be, well, that was dumb. <laughs> that was a waste of 8-8s. You just went out there and did the itch. When in fact, it's probably the coolest step in, that defines the lady hop. Especially when you talk about Frankie Mann and the, uh, somebody mentioned to me the other day about Harry, uh, there was a white couple uh, that Frankie Manning and his partner Anne competed against in 1935 at the Apollo Theater. And believe it or not, I know this is so weird, but, but this happened. The best of the black dancers, Frankie Manning and Anne, and, and then it was against the best of the white dancers. There was actually segregated jitterbug contests, believe it or not. And so the finals went to the Apollo Theater on stage. 
and they battled it out for the best. Well, guess what? They tied. They did a final, uh, a, another final. They tied again. They did another semifinal. They tied three times. And then Frankie Manning goes, and then I did the itch. <laughs> no one had seen it before. <laughs> and he won. That's what I want to get back to. You know what I mean? Like that friendly camaraderie of you know you've been beat. You know what I mean? And there's no better judge, hopefully, is yourselves, you know? And this is like how we danced in the 90s, because we battled each other, like in the corner of the ballroom floors, you know? And we battled and we competed against each other, and we were the judges, you know? And you know when you've been beat. You know, you know, ah, you bastard, you got me with that double kickball change thing. I don't know what it was, but ah, I'll get you tomorrow night. We got tomorrow night, it's okay, you know what I mean? And like, it's all about every night, and that's what you would do, is push yourself, push yourself, push yourself, push yourself. And that's the kind of stuff I kind of want to get back to, is pushing ourselves, but in a really friendly, friendly way. And, and it's, what a great way to lose. Oh, he did the itch and I lost. Shut, you know? What a fun way to lose, you know? Instead of like, well, you know what? You technically did this flawlessly wrong, and then you did this wrong, and then, like, we're getting a little bit into the danger zone of ballroom. When we start talking about Lindy Hop competitions. T talking about losing, I already lost uh, since we ran out of time, but um, <laughs> depending on. Oh. Yeah, a little. <laughs> um, but, um, on, on, on the ballroom side, may, maybe we have five more minutes to touch them. For, for me, very important topic that I would like to, to hear about. But are there any on, on the boy ballroom and the big ballrooms and how they happen to be, uh, are there any questions of you in the audience? How was the dress code back then? Oh, it, it depended on where you were. It depended. In the Savoy Ballroom, total dress code. You had to have a jacket. Absolutely, you had to have a dress code. And no, actually, believe it or not, at the Savoy Ballroom, no same-sex dancing. Yeah. But you have to also keep in mind, the Savoy Ballroom was breaking down barriers in other ways, it means. And the most important one was the racial barrier. So they couldn't cheat in other, take, they couldn't risk other things, right? So, uh, but, but that's a very, very good question. Um, but yeah, it, it, there's a scene, the spirit moves. It is, the spirit moves in the documentary, for those of you who do not know, it was filmed around 1951-52, and it, we've talked about this. It's just been a, on the subject a lot lately for some reason. Um, basically, there was no cameras allowed at the Savoy Ballroom. No filming, no cameras. Um, uh, no, vid, no filming cameras. Um, and Mira Dean, who uh, immigrated to America, Uh, she was she was a Russian ballerina who fell in love with with jazz dance and Lindy Hoppers and all that. She really really wanted to film in the Savoy Ballroom, so she made a deal with the Savoy, and they said, okay, if you set your camera up and don't touch it, you can do it, and that way the people that want to be in front of the camera can be in front of the camera, but everybody else can avoid it, and so that's the deal. And you can see scenes in the spirit moves from this camera, and um, there's one epic particular scene where two guys start dancing together. And you can see the ballroom, the bouncer, and they're in, a, they're in a jam circle kind of a thing, right? Oldest trick in the book. If you're going to do something naughty, you do it in a jam circle to make it really tight so people outside can't see it. <laughs> And it's the same with the kids today doing their little bump and grind shit. Um, they just start a really tight, small circle and the parents watching the dance, they have no idea what's going on in the middle of that jam. But you should see the bouncer break through the people, like physically break through people, all the way to the two guys and physically break their arms apart. You can see it in the spirit moves. It's on YouTube. This scene is on YouTube. But it's just showing you, but it's showing you the locals dancing too, who are also obviously flaunting uh, the, the, the rules, so to say. So, yeah, but uh, dress code, always a dress code. That, that wasn't even an option or question back then. We didn't need that back in those days. When you left the house, you left the house in a respectful manner. That's just weird today, right? I want to wear my Crocs. I wear Crocs in public today, everybody, all right? At home. I can't believe I just said that to the public. Shit. That's between us, you guys. That's between us. Yeah, yeah, we cut that out in the video. Yeah, you cut that out of the video. I don't wear Crocs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there, are there any further questions? Okay, let, let's quickly, just give me an idea of the concept of um, house rent parties. 
uh, I want to touch the topic of blues dancing. You know, we, okay. we talked about that. So okay. tell us about the, the concept of house renting parties. What music was played and how that. Idea right, was. Uh, house renting parties. Yeah, they, they took all kinds of different shapes and names and, and so forth. But basically, it's just a way to to, to uh, you're going to throw a party in order to make money so you can pay for your rent. Right. So it's about. You want to do as much as possible to bring people to your apartment to have a party. So you, obviously you want a good band, right? Some kind of good food, of course, and of course alcohol. And um, and then you're going to charge something at the door, usually 25 cents or something like that. But you want to charge enough, like I said, to, 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 so you can pay for rent. Um, in the south, we had fish fish fries. Same thing as a house rent party, but it was called a fish fry. Yeah, because obviously we don't have apartments in the south. You're in the you're in the <laughs> it's totally different part of the country, uh, but but nonetheless, and, and so this is where it kind of stems from, um, but the blues part, that's at the very end of the parties, that's not the normal part, of, there's no such thing as a blues party, like in what you're saying, but uh, but yeah, it was a regular house party, a regular dance party. And the musicians play party music, like correct, hot swing music, or even correct. sweet music? Or absolutely, absolutely, yeah, um, and if, if you... Yeah, and if you you can read a lot about if you start reading more and more about 30s uh, autobiographies and biographies of musicians, especially the more older death, uh, the more older musicians like Pops Foster and so forth, you read all about these private parties all the time, and uh, they, all the time. Anyways, yeah, they they party, they eat, they drink, they get drunk, and then the like like parties. I hope today by two, three, four in the morning it starts to get a little slower. And then everybody starts looking around the room on who looks good at this hour. Everybody at this hour, because you're drunk. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then that's where the, that's where it kind of happens. Yeah, and of course they didn't use the term blues back then, as you know. Uh, Frankie called it the grind. And um, as and I only would say this because Frankie said it, but that's where Frankie he would put his girl up against the wall, and that's where they dance against the wall. Um, but it was all. It was all very sexual. It was very sexual. It wasn't a sport like today, or uh, or whatever. You know what I mean? It wasn't like like it, it, blues means different things in every country and every city. So I have to watch out what to say here. Um, but yeah, there's some cities uh, in America, for instance, that blues means one thing, and then there's different cities in America where blues means another thing. They're both right, to be honest. They're both correct and they're both wrong at the same time. Um, but yeah, some scenes are all about leaving a little bit of room for baby Jesus between you and your partner. And then other scenes are like, no, nah, body to body. It's always body to body. And but and of course, there's the, like today, we, I suppose, and I don't go to many blues events. Uh, I have been and I have taught at blues events, but not many. And um, but yeah, it's so it, it was a whole different thing. But back then in the 30s, specifically house rent parties, no, it's you're trying to find out who you're probably going to go home with tonight. Before it gets any later, it's two o'clock. You know what I mean? It's three o'clock. Wow, everyone's getting really beautiful looking. <laughs> By four, woo! You know, yeah. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. But that's a typical house rent party pertaining to the concept of blues dance. Uh -huh. And uh, again, you can read about this in Frankie's book. Um, but it means different things in different. Like I said, it means completely. And, and, and house rent party is specifically a party that's meant to make money to pay for rent. There's plenty and plenty. The majority of private parties were not out to make money for rent. They were just parties to party, you know. And um, that's a whole different thing. And one last thing I want to end with: when one of the great dancers from Los Angeles, Vena Archer. She's one of the what we call the Big Four, the Ray Rand dancers in Los Angeles. Uh, during the war, she was work working at a place called Billy Bird Swing Club in Hollywood, which was kind of the home of bebop. It's the same venue where. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie played, and uh, the most famous thing that happened there, I think, was Billie Holiday sang, and somebody in the audience was mocking her, so she went down from the stage and straight stabbed the person. <laughs> I think that's one of the coolest stories I've ever heard. <laughs> like, finally, someone stabs a fucking heckler. Um, it took Billie Holiday to do it, you know? Uh, but anyway, Slim and Slam were the house band there, and that's where Slam left Slim, and then it became Slim and another bass player named Bam Bam. But they would have parties in LA all the time, all the time. And so Venna and Johnny Archer, Johnny Archer is the first guy in Los Angeles to, to find Dean Collins when Dean Collins first moved to Los Angeles and he took him in. 
Well, they used to go to his parties all the time, and they were the only white people at his parties. But they discovered, and all of Slim, Slim Gallery, if I'm talking about Slim and Slam, he would have this big silver chalice full of Tutti Frutti ice cream in his parties. And they thought it was the weirdest thing, because everybody knows the song Tutti Frutti, but Venna Archer, Venna told me, she goes, you know what we found out? Uh, Venna, she was a super hip, hip, hip chick, Venna was. She goes, it was because they were all junkies. They were all heroin junkies. And that Tutti Frutti was their sugar fix. Keep the night going. And I was like, damn, if only all the swing dancers knew what those lyrics meant. <laughs> Man. And that's like the whole swing era is, is, is that. Just the, the word play, what you think something means, no, it means something different, but that's okay, leave it there. And, uh, and the same thing with the dances, it's just, uh, it's a very different time period, I suppose. And um, we're, 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 we have done a very good job. I should say the Swedish, the Swedes, the British, um, and of course the uh, Pasadena dancers, the Gwib in the revival of the 80s of the Lindy Hop, they did a very, very good job. We're all continuing the job they've done of plucking the flowers from history and leaving the shit behind. or just nerds like me, or maybe you want to start researching your own little avenue of dance or music, um, you can find me on, of course, Facebook with Two Bar Break. That's my group, Two Bar Break, dance history group, and I have a page called Two Bar Break that I just put weird stuff up on. But the group, I do share all my historical stuff that I come across in my night researching. And many YouTube videos under that name. Yeah, right? and also so Super Break YouTube. Check that out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Bye -bye. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. Thank for, you guys, I appreciate it. Yeah, I can, I can